Hello again. Right, so today I'm <coughs> going to talk about the singularity. Now, um, some of you will have heard of the singularity and some of you won't have. Um, so the singularity is the point at which technology advances beyond our abilities. Right? Now, some people consider this when a computer can do more processing than we can as a human being. Some think it's about when computers start making themselves. Right? Now, <clears throat> one of the interesting questions is, is that when computers are faster than us, what will that actually mean? Right? Now, surprisingly, somewhat surprisingly, if you have a look at the, the supercomputers that are out there, the top, the K computer in Japan, the, the top supercomputer just released, is a 10 petaflop computer. Now, the human brain is about 100 teraflops. So that computer is already 100 times faster than an individual brain. So by some measures of the singularity, we are already there, right? We've already got to the point where there is a computer on Earth that can do more processing per second than your entire brain. So in some versions of singularity, we're already there. Uh, if you have a look at the top 500 list, um, you can have a look at the processing speeds and the predictive line. Now, this is almost amazing how well this fits straight lines. This is a graph of the current best performance in the top 500 list, right? The top 500 list of supercomputers. And the, the blue line in the middle there is, the, five, is the, the very most powerful machine in the 500. The yellow line, the orangey line at the bottom, is the 500th fastest machine in the world. And the purple line is the sum of all of them. Now, just on the edge there, which you can't see very well, in the, this year, 2012, the slowest of the 500 is 50 terahertz. The human brain is 100 terahertz. So the human brain still sits in the top 500 list of supercomputers, but only just. We're only just still in our top 500 list. And every year, the top 500 list is advancing. So we now have computers that are more powerful than us. That's already a given. They can do more operations per second than our brain. So in that area, that's what's going to happen. It's going to keep doing that, and we're going to keep falling behind the computers. And that means, well, OK, we're now in the vision of the future, where we have computers more powerful than us. What does that mean? What are our visions of the future? Well, you've got the, the I was chatting earlier, the, the WALL-E version, um, where we all sit in big fat chairs and drink out of wee cups. All our meals are in a cup. And the computers just look after us while we hover around on our fat chairs. Um, yeah, that's, that's one vision of the, the intelligent future, where the, the robots just look after us. Um, <clears throat> other visions have humanoid robots that look like us and perform like us, and they play chess like we do, they walk around like we do, they, they fall in love like we do, they, <coughs> they, are, they are replicants, they replace us and look like us and do the same thing, sort of things we do. Um, that's extremely unlikely um, in my, my mind because there is no reason why a robot has to be restricted to the kinds of things we're restricted to. Right? The fact that I don't have an extra couple of legs, an extra couple of hands, is actually a problem for me. I would like more hands. Sometimes I need to do things where I've, two of my hands are busy and I want to go and grab something else. I, it would be great, right? Extra arms, spin out and do stuff. That would be great. And if I didn't have a strained biological body that had a fixed number of bones, that's what I could do. But that's not a restriction for robots. So they're not going to look like us. Um, they're also probably not going to be like the Jetsons in our flying cars. Um, I remember somebody's complaint about um, 2010 was the, where the frick is my flying car? I was promised a flying car in 1960. They said by 2010 I'd have a flying car and I don't have a flying car. Um, you're probably not going to have a flying car in the future and technology is not going to help you get a flying car. Um, however, one of the things it will do is it will make our machines more intelligent. As the machines get faster, they start to be able to do more things. Now, in the talk on Friday, I talked, uh, on Thursday, I talked about parallelism. 
the massive parallelism, which is leading partly to this increased ability. Um, yesterday, I, um, I was talking, again, about sort of some of the, the things I mentioned with gamification and what technology is like in 20 years. The singularity is more like 30 years. And by 30 years' time, we're going to have sentient machines. And um, I should, oh, we'll go back to that. If you know hell, you should be able to perhaps hear that. I'm afraid I can't do that. Now, hell is a sentient computer. Um, this was 2001, which, um, yeah, it was 11 years ago that we were supposed to have this already, right? and it's not here yet. Um, the thing about a sentient machine is that once we get really, really intelligent machines, we have to work out what they're going to do. Are they going to be like hell? Are they going to be sentient machines? Are they going to be conscious? Do, will they understand their world? Will they understand us? Will they start competing with us? Okay. So to answer some of that questions, we have to start thinking about consciousness. What is consciousness? Right? What does it mean to be conscious? What is it that makes us us? Right? Because we know that, that without our brain, if you, if you have no brain, you can keep a body alive for quite a long time without a cortex, without an upper brain. Right? The body will keep ticking over. You keep giving it nutrients, you keep stimulating it, it'll just keep doing its thing. Right? So part of the, the thing that makes us us is our embedded experience of our central nervous system. Right? My arms, my legs, the rest of my body, that probably can be replaced by mechanical parts. All of that can be replaced. Right? I probably don't, I don't really need a working leg to be considered a human being, to be conscious, to be sentient, to understand my reality. But the central nervous system, that's probably where I reside, where the thing that is me as a person is. Now, if we're going to have intelligent computers, when will they have a central nervous system? When will they be embedded and experience the world the way we do? Right? And what will that look like? What will their qualia, their experience of the world? Right? The qualia is, is that the essence of experience, the essence of understanding. Now, one of the, the classic examples for intelligence is the Turing test. The Turing test has a, um, a counter, the Chinese room problem. Now, the Turing test says, if you look, well, if, if you behave like a human being, right, so if I'm in a text chat with you, and I ask you questions, and you answer me questions, and I ask you some questions, and you ask a question, and I can't tell the difference between you and a robot, then the robot is sentient and is, is is equivalent to a human. The robot is intelligent. Now, the Chinese room argument against that is the idea that, well, if it's just text chat, I could fake it. I could pretend. I could get a big book of everything you could say and then appropriate responses to everything you could say, and you just type in some Chinese text. I look it up in my big book of responses, find that Chinese text, grab this Chinese text, and give it back to you. I don't need to understand Chinese. I'm just pattern matching, right? I'm just mat matching what you've said with what I know is a reasonable answer. But qualia is that the, the thing missing. It's that essence of experience. It's the essence of understanding. And it's one of the things that makes us more than just a mechanical process that is moving through the world. And this is what gives us our sense of consciousness. Now, as I said, computers already are faster than we are. Right? The supercomputer is faster than me. However, a bit like an American muscle car, right? lots and lots of power, no handling. Right? We have, we're like European cars. right? We can go around corners and we can steer, and, and we've got really good handling. Now, the really ultra-fast computers, they don't have such good handling. Right? They can do the same task, simple task, very, very quickly, and lots and lots of them. But we don't actually know how to get to this qualia, how to get to this experience of the world. And one of the questions is, is sleep part of that? Is sleep part of the thing that makes us 
different and interesting. Um, and uh, there, there is the, um, will androids dream of electric sheep um, question, uh, which, which comes up. And if we're going to create intelligent entities and sentient entities and conscious entities, what will their experiences be like? Will they need to dream the way we do? Will they need to feel the things that we need to feel? Will they need to, to live in the world in the way we live in the world, the way we are affected by the world? Will they need hunger even though they don't need power? Will they need pain? Will they need suffering? Will they need love? What, what, will, what are the needs of a sentient entity? Now, <clears throat> one approach to trying to get to this point where we have AIs that are sentient is to say, okay, well, let, let's give up on trying to artificially create intelligent organisms. Let's just download our brain into computers, right? That'd be awesome. Then I can live forever in a computer because my brain will be in the computer and I'll control, I'll be the computer and I'll control the world and that'll be great. Um, and somehow I'm going to measure everything that's going on up here and put it into a computer. Um, and this is sometimes called something called the connectome. Right? You've heard of a genome. Right? The genome is your genetic code and what you are created. When you, when you take your genome, that what is what is expressed when we create a human body. The connectome is the idea that the connections inside your brain are who you are. Right? Who you are is not the bits of flesh on my finger. It's not my leg, not my stomach. It's what's going on up here. It's what's inside my head. It's the connections inside my brain that make me me. So if I'm going to download myself into a computer, I need to take my connectome and somehow get it into the computer. Right? So it's the connections. Now, um, this seems like an interesting task. I mean. The brain's a finite thing. I can count the number of neurons. There are um, 100 billion of them, so there's quite a lot. Um, and if you have a look at this, this wee worm here, um, C. elegans is this, the most well-studied organism in the world. We know everything about it, pretty much. And there are 300 neurons out of about 1,000 cells. Right, it's got 1,000 cells, and there are 300 little processing neurons that actually do the cognition and actually do the thinking. And the diagram there is a connection graph showing how all of the neurons are connected to each other. Right? So we've, we've done it for this tiny, 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 very small worm. And so the idea is, well, once you've done it for this, you can then scale that up. And yes, yes, you can start to scale it up. Um, there are some problems with scaling it up. Um, going from 300 to 10 billion is quite hard. Um, but one of the big problems is we don't really understand what it's doing. There are limitations to downloading our brain into a computer. All right, now, it's all well and good that, that we can take each neuron in our head, we can find who it's connected to, and recreate that and simulate it in a computer. And when we get these massively parallel machines that I was talking about yesterday, that, uh, on, on, on Thursday, that massive parallelism allows us to simulate each of those neurons and it, it simulate each of the interactions. So we can build the model. What we can't do and what we don't really know how to do is learning. Right? We know quite a bit about the static structure of the brain we still don't understand really how the brain learns. We've got some guesses, and neural networks do some interesting things, and we have some, some Hebbian-style learning, but actually understanding the whole process in neurons and in biological organisms, we still actually don't understand that. And one of the things that, that I believe makes me me is not just everything I've been up to this point. It's my ability to learn and interact and be dynamic. It's my learning that makes me important and makes me is, is part of me. Otherwise, you could just create an encyclopedia of my life, and you could ask me questions about it, and I can only ever give you responses about what I have previously experienced. Because without learning, 
I don't grow. I don't become a new person. I don't remain interesting. I just remain a textbook. Um, and this is one of the, the pain and suffering of dementia and Alzheimer's and, and those cognitive impairments is that people stop learning. They become static, they become stale, they become old. You, you don't find the real person that was there. And while we don't know how neural networks learn, we won't be able to make computers sentient and feel the way we do because we don't understand how we are the way we are. We don't understand how we learn. Emotions. This is another one of the big problems for the, for the singularity, is that, yes, we now have computers that are massively power, um, powerful, and they can do an enormous amount. But if I inject you with different hormones, you behave differently, right? When, they took, when the Russians took teenage girls and they injected them with testosterone to make them swim faster, they started behaving like teenage boys. Right? They thought like teenage boys, they became aggressive like teenage boys. They, they were mentally changed by the hormones that they were being injected with. Um, the father of modern computing, um, Alan Turing, who is, is the inventor of the Turing test, for example, and created the first computers. Right? The person who created the very first real computers, he was homosexual. And in Britain at the time, the, um, the, you, it was illegal to be homosexual, so he had a choice of going to prison or being injected with estrogen. Right? Because they felt that if you give him female hormones, somehow they'll stop him being gay. Um, bit strange. But when they injected him, he had massive mood swings. He was basically going through the emotions of a woman when she's going through a period, right? He suddenly got all of these, he got hot flushes and he got, he got irrational and emotional and then very rational and very focused and, and swings all over the place, right? You inject people with hormones, it changes who they are. Now, with computers, do we really want to simulate that effect of injecting heroin into ourselves and changing what's happening in our brain? Do we want to be able to tell the computer here, have some have some testosterone so you become aggressive. Have some heroin so things all go sparkly and strange. Where will the emotions come from? Where will the, the hormone, the chemistry, where is it that the bits that make our body connected to our brain, where does that come in? Because with an ultra-fast, ultra-powerful computer, we can do a lot of reasoning. Right? We can do a lot of processing. We can understand the consequences of things. But understanding the consequences of things only matters if you care about the consequences of things. Right? If you don't care, if you have reason free from passion, right? this is, this is going to be one of the, 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 the strange things about the super fast computers that are developing new technologies and, and processing new, new algorithms and developing the next CPUs, is there going to be reason without passion? Now, this idea has been around for a long time. Aristotle talked about the law being reason free from passion. Um, and if you take away your desires, if you take away your needs, then you become a very strange individual. And one of the things, I've found the stroke patients who actually lose parts of their lower brain stem and their, some of their emotions, they can reason about everything, right? So they can sit down and they can say, well, um, I could make myself some lunch and um, I could make some pancakes, so that would take some flour and some eggs and some milk and I'd put them in and I'd mix them up and I'd fry them in a pan. They can tell you everything that's going on, right? And they can tell you about the possibilities. Or I could sit here and I could not have lunch and then I would start getting hungry, and I might start to starve, and um, then I might die, and yeah, um, that would be a possibility. Or, and without any emotional connection to differentiate the states of the world, to say, me being alive, and my family being alive, and having relationships is better than slowly decaying away and dying, right? Um, without our emotional connection to the world, we can't rank these. We can come up with all the possibilities. We can analyze them all, work out what's going to happen, 
but we don't care what's going to happen. We don't have an opinion about which option is better. Right? That's going to be one of the interesting issues with the singularity is working out when it will care. Right? If we have a, this massively powerful computer that can calculate everything, all the possibilities, how does it know which thing to do? Right? Now, um, in humans, we do that with our chemistry. We do that with our connection to the world, our physical connection to the world, with our emotional connection to the world. In computers, although they have all the power, all of the raw horsepower to get the job done, we still don't know what job they're supposed to do, and we still don't know how to rank those options. Right? How do they decide whether or not setting off a nuclear weapon is better than not setting off a nuclear weapon? Well, they don't care, right? I mean, there, isn't, there is no emotional state for them to care about. All the options, they can just calculate all the potentials. We as human beings are the ones that then drive the desires. We are the ones that have desires, not the computers. Now, there is a question is, do we need to add passion to computers to make them conscious and make them true artificial intelligence? Um, and what will that look like? How will we add passion to computers? What should we do? Should we make it like games? Right? We, reinfor we, we, we can train you to do activities by giving you reinforcement in games. Should we make computers really good at playing games and want to play games? Because right? then they'll learn things and they'll play the games and they'll, they'll have desire to keep playing games. Um, will that make them more like us? Will that make them conscious? Will that change the world in, in useful ways? Well, when we do create these, these super powerful computers, even without making them conscious, even without making them emotional, we're going to have some interesting problems to deal with. One of the problems is experience. Now, I've, I, I lecture at university. I, I lecture at the, the uh, Jervik Hoogskule. Um, and I've been programming for 27 years. I started when I was 10. I've got a lot of programming experience. My experience matters still when I'm programming. Right? Having had all of that experience of how to debug and how to find bugs, that still matters. Now, over the years, I started to notice that some of my experience doesn't matter as much as it used to matter. Right? When students ask me, should I use Unity or Blender as my game engine, I used Blender seriously about two years ago. Right? I played with Unity about 18 months ago. Is my opinion on which one of those two is better, is it valid anymore? Because right? they've both been updated. They've both changed since I experienced them. Now, the singularity where computers start developing so quickly right, that even without the passions and reasons, they create new computers, they create new technologies. They create technology so quickly that we can't keep up. When I wake up in the morning, all of my programs have changed. They've all been improved. Because overnight, the computer worked out that yesterday, you guys were using the computer this way. right? And we noticed that you were clicking incorrectly on an option. Right? You keep clicking on this option, and then you'd, you'd have to undo that path. So we've decided that it would be better if you just didn't have that option, and we'll make the workflow much faster by removing it. And so when I wake up in the morning, that confusing option is now gone. Right? And it's now much easier to use. My experience from yesterday doesn't help me decide what I'm going to do tomorrow. That loss of experience, that lack of, of usefulness of all of my previous experience is going to be one of the consequences of having computers so powerful that they make their own computers. Um, now, this is an example of, of Windows 7. How much is your Windows 7 experience useful in your Windows 8 programming? Right? And your Windows 8 telling your grandmother how to use Windows 8, how useful is knowing Windows 7? A little. Not as much as it was a year ago, where she was still on Windows 7. The move from Windows 3 to, um, to XP and stuff, I mean, uh, Windows 95, 95 to XP, XP Vista. We keep changing things. Experience used to be valuable. When we get to the singularity, when we get machines that are making our technology for us, 
my experience, my knowledge of what has happened in the past suddenly becomes useless, right? Because it's, there's no point in asking me. I don't know which one's better. It's changed overnight, right? Which, which is a better option? Well, you just have to look at them now. You can't ask somebody. You can't go back in time. You can't say, how was this done yesterday? Um, and that makes it impossible to predict. Part of, of one of the amazing features of intelligence is our ability to predict the future. It is the core of science, right? The whole thing about science is that theories that don't predict anything are useless. If your theory doesn't predict something, it's not useful science. Science is about prediction. In the singularity, the technology is changing so quickly that we as human beings can't predict what's going to happen next because the technology is developing faster than we can keep up with. Now, we're already kind of experiencing this. Um, certainly, your, your parents' generation are probably starting to feel a bit of this, that um, phones are changing far too fast for them. The computers change too fast. They, they can't keep up anymore, right? They just want a simple phone that they can press the buttons and they can ring somebody, right? This is what my father has been saying to me. His, phone's, his analog phone is about to die because they're closing down the network, and he wants the same phone. He doesn't want one of these new touchscreens. He thinks they're, they're stupid. He wants an old phone. It's changing too quickly. Now, that's my father. He's getting older. You guys are keeping up. But after the singularity, in 20, 30 years' time, when you are in your 40s and 50s, we'll hit a point where the technology is changing so quickly, you won't know what's coming. You won't be able to predict the next thing. You won't be able to keep up with the technology. Now, that makes us into passengers. Right? We're not driving the, the development anymore. We're not creating the world. We are holding on and seeing where it takes us. Right? Now, that's, that's going to be quite scary because we don't know where that's going to take us. I can't predict after the singularity what happens because that's the point, right? I can try and predict up to the singularity. I can talk about the parallelism and how we're going to have more and more parallel machines. And, and I can talk about screens getting higher in resolution. I can talk about getting augmented reality and having screens on your eye. And I, I can talk about connecting to your bodies. And I, these are things I can predict. I can talk about nanotechnology. At the singularity, it stops. I can't predict after that point. Because what will nanotechnology do? I don't know, the computer will work it out. All right? And there is the phrase, um, technology at a sufficiently complex level is equivalent to magic. Right? And already, for, for, for um, Stone Age people, right? if you go and find, find some of the tribes in, in deep Papua New Guinea or in, in, in hidden parts of South America, you show them technology and it's just magic. Right? Because it is so far between where their understanding is and what's happening on the device that they cannot see how it works. They cannot understand anything about it. We are going to become Stone Age as the technology starts developing so quickly that we look at it and go, well, that's magic. I don't know how that works because none of us know how that works because the computers have made the computers that make that material. Right? That's going to be really freaking scary, right? I'm not sure how we're going to cope as a species once we become passengers. Right? I certainly know that some of us will do the, the um, Luddite thing, right? We will reject technology. We will say, no, 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 I'm, I'm just, I don't want a new phone. I want to use my old phone, and I want to talk in it, and I want it to work. Um, and I think we're going to break down into kind of clans, right? We're going to become groups of individuals who try and stay at the same level of technology. Right? A bit like our, our music, for example. Right? You can go online and listen to a 1960s radio station. Right? And it's just 1960s stuff. You don't have to hear any modern material. It's just 1960s. That, that's calm and that's fine. And some people want to, want to do that, right? They don't want modern music. They don't want new toys. They don't want new tools. They just want the life the way it was. There were people in Norway who will go into the mountains and go, no, no, 
candles and firewood. That's what I need, right? Candles, firewood, an axe. Um, and I'll hunt and fish, and I'll just live in the mountains, and you guys just go to it, right? You sort out your world, just leave me alone. Um, one of the problems with this, and one of the problems that in 30 years' time, singularity occurs, suddenly all of our technology starts developing so rapidly, none of us can keep up. We then start competing for resources. Right? And one of the, the real issues becomes resource limits. And the singularity happens at about the same time as we run out of some interesting stuff. Right? And we're going to run out of interesting stuff before we get to the singularity. And that means we're going to have to start competing with each other for limited resources. And we've, we've seen that in the past. It creates wars. Right? Now, as the massively advanced technology starts occurring and we start moving into this phase where it's developing faster than we can understand, we're also going to lose an understanding of what resources to grab. When you guys are playing a, a real-time strategy game, right, you know the resources that are there. right? You go out and you grab the, the gold mine, and you grab the, the trees, and you, try and you try and control resources. right? And you build up your resources, and you build up your army, and you take over the other guy. Um, the singularity means that we start developing technology, and we're not quite sure which of the resources is going to be most useful for the next layer of technology. Um, and if you have a look at the, this, this is from New Scientist. Um, there's an interesting one. Indium for LCD screens. 4 and 13. Indium runs out in four years' time. The bit used to make your LCD screen, the actual the, the back plate of the LCD screen, um, we actually have none, no, none of that left in four, in four years' time. So, hmm. We need to start going and taking LCDs off people who don't need them anymore, right? so we can make a new one for ourselves. We start competing for a limited resource. We start recycling. However, you can only recycle stuff that people don't want anymore. Once it's all used up and everybody wants the LCD they've got, how do you get a bigger LCD? You go and find someone who isn't as attached to their LCD as you are, to your new LCD, and you take it from them. Limited resources create wars. The singularity will be part of that conflict. That's going to be weird, right? That's going to be strange because, again, we will not be able to predict what it will decide to do, what, what nanotechnology it will make to solve these problems. So we won't know which, which resources to grab, which resources are important, aren't important, what bits of the world are we, are we going to use. These, these become strange. Lead. Lead. You think lead? There's lots of lead around. Eight years. Eight years to the end of lead. That's a bit of a worry. Um, we use lead in lots of stuff, lots of batteries and lead pipes. Um, already, if you've got copper piping in, in New Zealand, if you have copper piping uh, in the North Island, someone will come and steal it. They can't lay phone cables in Africa. Because if you lay the copper cable in some African countries, the day after you leave, poor people will come along, they'll dig it up and steal the copper and sell the copper. Because copper is so expensive. And copper is running out. Lead is running out. If you have a look at, at um, tantium, we use for mobile phones, um, and using cell phones and camera lenses. All right, you've got. 20 years of that. Again, around about the singularity. Copper. We think we've got about 40 years left for all of the world's copper. And then we run out of copper. Right? Hmm? So the, the resources that we need to behave in the way that we like to behave, right, with our, our resource intense rich world. If demands grow, we're going to run out of other things. Silver in 15 to 20 years. Zinc in 20 to 30 years. Uranium in 30 to 40 years. Right? That includes all of reprocessing all of the military stock. Right? For the uranium stuff, they go and they have a look at the military. has got a whole bunch of bombs. Right? If you turn those into nuclear power, we still run out in 30 to 40 years. This is at the same time as the singularity. Our supercomputers will be creating new technology which will be dealing with this problem. But we won't know what it's going to do. 
Now, for me, as a computer scientist, as someone who's done artificial intelligence, I did my research, my PhD was on the functional purpose of REM sleep. Right? So I studied how the human brain uses REM and uses sleep to retain its knowledge and to build knowledge. We studied how you make artificial intelligent machines. That's going to be a problem when these machines hit these resource limits because that machine will see this and have to work out what to do. Right? How does it reallocate those very limited resources? Right? Now, this is not a, a kind of far off universe weird world. This is the world we live in. This is the world we're going to have to inhabit. Now, the inability to predict, the inability to, to know what's going on, means that when we do this thing of downloading our brains into computers, right, it's going to take another 20 or 30 years before we could, could possibly do this. When we try and live eternally, when we try and extend our life, when we try and keep living the way we've been living, and buying new computers and, and having new stuff and having new cars, we're going to have to deal with the fact that the resources we have are not going to be allocated by other human beings. They're not going to be, you're not going to be able to go to somebody and say, hey, why did you decide that they needed that more than I needed it? There's going to be a computer that has calculated your needs, calculated what's best. It's worked out how to control the resources. It's worked out new ways to use the resources, and it will make that allocation. Now, socially, we already have some limitations on the use of technology. Um, my, my favorite example is driving cars. Right? We do not want to be killed by robots. Right? Fairly understandable. But we're quite happy to let humans drive cars, even though we know for a fact that more people die because humans are driving cars. If the robots drove the cars, fewer people would die. Now, with the singularity, once computers are doing all the processing, we're going to have the same question. Do we want computers to be in control and make our lives better than they will be otherwise? Or do we want to have a human being to blame and a human being to, to say, hey, it's your fault. I can get angry at you, and you're going to change. Right? Because the computer doesn't have passion. We can't influence it. We don't know why it's ranked things the way it has. We can no longer predict what it's going to do. So as a group, as individuals, as friends, and as family, we have to work out what level of technology we're willing to accept. And particularly difficult, if the technology exists and we have these super fast computers that can create new computers, can create new processing mechanisms, can create a new world for us, how do we stop people who are corrupt and people who have their own desires from using that even if we reject it? Right? Now, Norway faces this problem with the labor market. In Norway, you're not supposed to work too hard. You're supposed to have a work-life balance. Right? And that's great, and it's, it's fantastic that you only work a limited number of hours and you spend the rest of the time with your family. However, the rest of the world doesn't work that way. And games is a really tricky one, because in computer game development, computer game programming, computer, gamers, and computer programmers tend to work much harder than the rest of Norway. Right? If you look at Funcom, they're working 60 hours a week. Right? That's fairly, fairly average. That's not how Norway works. The, re the reason they have to do that is to keep up with the rest of the world. With the singularity, the rest of the world's going to have these computers. They're going to have computers that are ultra-intelligent, ultra-fast, and can create new computers. Even if we, as individuals, reject that, we go up into the mountains, we say, no, no, candles and firewood, that's all I need. Somebody's going to have it. Somebody's going to have that technology. They're going to have nanotechnology with it. That nanotechnology plus ultra-fast computers plus 3D printing plus fabrication plus creating your own machines, that will be in the hands of somebody. If we, in Norway, reject the 
singularity and say, no, no, we're just going to stop developing new technology. We're going we're gonna, we're gonna to say no to technology. It will overrun us. Right? We can say no, but it will come. It will come from outside. And at that point, we're going to have to fight. Now, the Cyber Defense Ministry have already said that, that they need to hire people from the gathering, pretty much, because the new threat is on the net. The problem is, even the new threat on the net has only got about 20 or 30 years before the threat is not from hackers, the threat is from other computers. Right? The singularity, the computers that are faster and more intelligent than the human being, they will be the threat. And who is going to control them? How are we going to control them? How are we going to give them emotions? How are we going to teach them to be good citizens? Right? Teach them that, no, no, you, you're not supposed to just take lead, or if you need calcium, you don't grab a whole bunch of people and like mince them up and extract the calcium. That's, that's not the best way of getting calcium. Right? Why do we prefer one method over another? Well, we're a bit squeamish about killing people. Right? We kind of like them. Um, so our job, our job in the Western society as intelligent people here at The Gathering is not to fight against the technology. It's to help develop it and develop it as quickly as we can so that when the supercomputers come along, we as good citizens, as good teachers, can show it what the right options are. Right? Can show it how to behave in a way that doesn't end up with humans trying to hang on and failing. So my challenge to you as attendees of the gathering is not to be merely consumers of technology, not to say, OK, it's already too advanced. I'm just going to watch it how it goes, and that'll be great. right? I'll always, we'll have new resources. We'll have new power. That's going to be great. No, no. Your job, if you want to be able to keep the life that we like, this kind of being able to turn up at the gathering, being able to talk to each other, eating, sleeping, being alive. Um, if we want to keep that, we have to be part of making the singularity. We have to commit to knowing enough about the technology to influence what's coming. All right? We can't sit back and ignore the future. All right? Because it will come, and unless you're a part of it, you will be swept away you will become a passenger. So with the scary thought of being a passenger on the singularity, do I have any questions? Quickly, I've got like two minutes. Why don't we just hard code emotions? Why don't we just put them in? The problem with emotions is we don't really understand them very well. We do know that there are, there are parts of the brain that, that deal with emotions. Um, and that they are significantly influenced by chemical reactions. We can encode some emotions, you're right. Um, we can encode fear, right? We can encode pain. We can do these. Um, the, one of the problems we have is we don't know how, we still don't really understand the brain and how it learns. Once we crack the learning code, which probably involves emotions because we certainly know that when you learn things, right, you learn them best when, you, when they're connected to an emotional state. Right? This is something that's really bad at universities, we, we, we tend not to do very well, is when you try and learn, you have to kind of want to know the answer. The more emotionally you are engaged in the question, right? so we let you founder around trying to debug something, when you find a bug that you've been programming, you learn the solution really deeply because you had an emotional connection. So there is something about emotions that help us learn. We don't really understand how the brain learns. We don't really understand all of its emotions. So we still don't know how to encode that. Right? And that's part of the handling issue, right? We have the raw power. We can do 10 petaflops worth of floating point operations um, a second. But we don't know what to do with all of that power. We don't know where it goes. So we'll try and encode emotions. Right, we'll probably get it wrong several times. Um, the, the simple like robot rules, don't hurt human beings, don't um, like, try and stay alive. Those simple rules aren't really going to be able to be encoded in these intelligent machines, right? not, not in that simple sense. And so 
we're going to have to work out how to get the machines to have emotions and learn using emotions. I've run out of my time, so um, with my scary message of go become creators of technology, not consumers of technology, I'll leave you, and if you've got any questions, I'll answer them down there. So thank you. Enjoy the rest. <laughs>